like Neetu mentioned, we, we already have 50 plus participants today on this panel. I'm really excited because it's an all women panel and we really get to see that happening in this legal industry. So specifically our focus today would be talk, to talk about women's contribution in the legal education and encourage the younger generation to take the forefront and discover certain careers in law and specifically uh, young girls who look up to this particular uh, profession. And today we have such prophetic, uh, you know, speakers um, who would like to share their journeys. Um, the, uh, the, the panelists or the, would, would be an, in a position to share some of their experiences um, in, in this particular journey. Uh, I know as a woman myself, it is somewhat a little tougher as compared to the other uh, counterparts we have here, but it's not impossible. Um, we've seen some great stories and we've been reading up with so many great achievements made by young girls and women in law. And this is something which we would like to focus on today's topic. Uh, of course, I would like to say that, you know, don't uh, be shy in terms of asking questions and it is not specifically in terms of women's contribution. I think young students, whether boys or girls or you know, people coming from different communities would like to hear these stories. You know, people who are from the community of the underrepresented or from a diverse community would also like to know what are those struggles and you know, what can they overcome by listening to these uh, beautiful stories we have today in terms of um, you know, Julie, Nehan, Dia and Kritika to share with, with the participants, their journey, um, their struggles probably, and you know, what it inspires them deeply to take up this particular course and this profession. So I would again request uh, the participants to please write into us in the Q&A section it's going to be a wonderful um, and an interesting topic to talk about in terms of the women's contribution in law. So I can already see almost 70 plus participants. Um, Neetu, I think we can go ahead and start the session and make it live. Absolutely. So I, this is already live, um, Afri, now. So you can go ahead and begin with the introductions. Right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. So good evening and good morning to one and all present here. I, Afrin Kalaso, I'm the Assistant Director for University Engagement and Partnership at LSAC Global. It is my honor to welcome you all to the third and very special webinar series on the topic, The Female Lead Impact of Women in Law, organized by LSAC Global under the Discover Law campaign. As promised, we are and we would be hosting a series of new discussion every month focusing on new initiatives and discoveries in the legal sector. The web webinars will be featuring Indian and international leaders to highlight the academic and professional opportunities for students in the field of law. And the themes will be focused on professional, academic, international and jurisprudential aspects of law. On behalf of LSAC and LS LSAC Global Leadership Team, I would like to thank all the panelists and our audience for the continued support, enthusiasm, and dedication towards improving access to legal education and increasing diversity of legal profession. On that note, I would like to share the background of today's theme. And before I begin, I would actually like to quote um, this line, which is something very special to my heart. It is by Maya Agnolo. She states that each time a woman stands up for herself without knowing it possibly, without claiming it, she stands up for all women. This quote truly highlights the essence of what we would like to share through the powerful stories by the women we have on our panel today. The overarching theme of this webinar is to talk about women's contribution to legal education and encourage younger generation to step up to the forefront and discover careers in law. We would be co uh, covering topics like women in leadership positions and aspirants journey from academic as well as corporate, corporate perspectives and more. So let me begin with the introductions. Today we, on our panel, we have Ms. Julie Scully. Julie is the director of the executive LLM in global business law at Columbia Law School. Prior to joining Columbia, Julie spent more than 10 years at Brooklyn Law School, where she began working on the program, development and academic administration, 
and was eventually tapped to establish and oversee all international programs. As Senior Director of International Programs, Julie was responsible for building Brooklyn Law School's LLM program. Julie also earned her JD from Indiana University, where she served as a, ma a managing editor for the Indiana Journal of Global Legal Studies, after which she practiced at two New York law firms. She also holds a BA in political science and criminal justice from Indiana University. We're so glad to have you today here, Julie. Thank you for joining us. We are also extremely honored to have with us Ms. Dia Gupta, Senior Manager Legal and in-house counsel at AstraZeneca, a research-based biopharmaceutical company. Ms. Dia has also worked with leading corporates like Wipro and Cognizant in the legal department. We're really excited to learn from you, your experience and your journey today. We're also delighted to have amongst us Ms. Kritika Patodi Bhandari. Ms. Kritika is an advocate at the Supreme Court of India, as well as the Delhi High Court. She is a board member at Vijay Bhumi University, where she actively works to create opportunities for students focused on their overall growth. She has done commendable work in the field of litigation as, and is also making constant efforts to propagate legal education amongst young lawyers and aspirants. Thank you, Kritika, for joining us today. And last but not least, we have on our panel, Ms. Nehan Sethi. Nehan is a graduate from Symbiosis Law School, Pune. She also works as a lawyer in the field of intellectual property laws. She's also the founder and CEO of Her Forum, a platform and community for women in law in India. Her Forum shares insights and learnings from women with strong voices in the legal field and is simultaneously building a community for fostering networking, meaningful conversations and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Nehan is also a shopper with World Economic Forum's Global Sharpest Community. Thank you, Nehan, for coming, taking our time from your busy schedule and joining us today. So let us start with the brief uh, opening and certain comments from each one of you about advice you would have for law school candidates. Why is today a good time for law school, especially for young girls watching and listening to you? I would like Julie to start with her comments first. Thank you. Um, thank you, Afreen, for that warm introduction and for bringing us all together today. I, I'm honored to be here, really. Um, so to address your, your first question, which is why, is why now? Why is now a good time um, for, for young women or you know, women in general to, to enter law? And I think that this last year has really been a time of introspection for a lot of people. Um, and in that time of stillness, in that pause, I think that people have gained a lot of clarity on what motivates them, what inspires them, what they want the world to look like, how much need there is in the world um, for strong women voices, um, how much you really needed. And so I think now is the, uh, the best time, um, you know, to enter law. Why would it now be the right time? I mean, that's the question that I would ask, seeing everything that's happening in the world and all of the change and the opportunity that people have had to really look inward and think about what it is that they really want to do, what is the, the way that we lived and have and have um, thought about things has all been kind of turned upside down. And so now is the time to really think about how we can kind of move forward and how we can be a part of positive change. Thank you, Julie, for that. Um, I would you know, direct the same question to Nehan now. In why do you think, you know, today is a good time to join law school? Uh, firstly, thank you, Arfin, for the introduction, and thank you so much for having me here today. It's such an honor. Uh, so just to go off what Julie said, you know, I completely agree. Um, why not? And and to speak specifically about, uh, you know, from an industry and global perspective, um, I think now is such an exciting time. Uh, if you think about it, there's so much disruption um, happening globally in every sector. And I think that's obviously um, affecting and impacting the legal sector as well. And and. I'm fortunate enough to, you know, interact with so many women doing such amazing things through her forum and through our conversations and, you know, speaking to women who are doing uh, from from India who are doing tech law now in Silicon Valley, women who are doing VC law. Um, I mean, the opportunities are just um, immense. So I think that now more than ever, it's, it's really exciting uh, to be in this field. And I personally feel that way as well. So I think it's actually a great time um, 
to be there and for, and and specifically um with regard to women i think that you know obviously there is still a, a gender diversity gap that does exist within the field but we're obviously very fortunate uh, me personally entering the profession right now to be at a time where there are so many um more opportunities and so many women to look up to as well which may not have been the case maybe a decade ago or, or more than that so i actually think it's it's a great time uh, on all fronts thank you nehan for that and i completely agree that we can see some sort of a progress not just in stem but also in law as as an upcoming field for women so that directs me to dia dia why do you think and do you see that sort of a trend in terms of young girls taking up law especially you know you working in the in house counsel section Yeah, hi thanks afreen um well i've seen a major change even from the time i passed out from college and the way the perceptions have changed from being a person who goes to court and has to litigate to joining the corporate field because earlier when i mean the the the, the kind of stereotyping that a lawyer would do is only going to court and holding files and i've also heard things like you know when you can't find another profession you pick up law but today things have really uh, you know changed both in terms of uh, women as i mean you know the, the diversity in terms of the colleges where people are taught i mean we're given the practical experiences we know what a corporate law career would look like even before we you know we can make the choices what litigation what would look like there's a lot of exposure for a lot of students nowadays as exchange program where you get exposure into the global uh, bit of it so i think with all of that and technology coming into play i think um, being a lawyer or studying law is is probably something which will give you an edge i mean i would take the liberty to say that this entire covid taught us that we kind we actually played a role we we were actually very busy i'm not I'm, you know this is not saying that others want but when there were disruptions when there were things that needed to be taken care of in terms of cyber security requirements or anything or data privacy i think it was lawyers who kind of had to step up and really hold forth so i believe the role has you know it's it's kind of manifested into different directions and all of us have opportunities and it's you don't really have to look into choosing the the, the more traditional type of laws you can do exciting things there's media there's a lot of things and i mean even in, in india i'm seeing there's there's a spout of uh, opportunities with startups so i think it's an encouraging and um, you know interesting period to kind of be a part of this uh, definitely we are thanks i mean you've given us an area of opportunities you know which are there for law aspirants now and you know this really brings me to kritika here because she is somebody who's been directly speaking to uh, high school students in terms of you know what inspires them so kritika you could let us know why do you think students want to study law today uh thank you so much arfleen for this opportunity so i mean always great fun to be and to be you know conversing with lsa lsac global in these fun and interesting conversations and especially so this time because it's an all women panel i mean nothing makes me happier uh, to have you know to be sharing this virtual stage with such eminent uh, you know women doing such amazing work so i think i have four reasons in mind as to i think why this is a great time for a lot of uh, you know young women to think of law as a career option well firstly is i strongly believe that law empowers right uh, generally as a tool you know just being aware of your rights understanding how the regulatory frame framework of the country is and just kind the kind of respect i feel lawyers you know generally enjoy in our society so i definitely think it puts you in an empowering position and i think empowerment is key for us to you know propel our gender, uh, our gender forward um second i strongly believe that you know when i interact with students nowadays a lot of them are talking the language of wanting to create social impact um you know and that's a very positive trend that i'm seeing uh, when i interact with students these days so when you're you know talking social impact i think no better like sort of you know uh, area you should study or rather discipline you should study than law because you know there's so much of opportunity for you to be able to create impact within the framework you know of the various tracks that are available to you after you complete your law degree a uh, third i think you know law school in itself uh, and i think i'm taking off from one of my co panelists here 
just is a stepping stone to so many endless opportunities right so gone are the days you know when we saw uh, saw a very you know stereotypical role being attached to lawyers of you know them just being in court i mean now you know law has become a stepping stone to so many different things i mean you want to join the government you want to do public policy you want to start your own venture um you want to you know uh, probably get into research i mean it's really endless you want to become a consultant i mean you know it's definitely very different uh in terms of the kind of opportunities that are available to you that probably were not available earlier so i definitely think that rather than you know thinking that you know law school makes you a lawyer i think you know students need to shift their perspective and kind of understand that law school is about gaining certain skill sets and those skill sets that you gain be it you know critical thinking analyzing you know uh, argumentative skills advocacy skills communication research these are skills that can actually open gateways to a lot of different professional tracks so that's why i definitely think it's a great option and definitely this is a great time to be in this profession there are so many women who are doing amazingly well uh, so definitely it's become easier uh, for you know all of us also who have joined the profession to be able to scale up the ladder in the profession thank you krithika for that and i completely agree with all the points you mentioned here because when it comes to being a lawyer i mean law school does teach you in terms of an holistic approach right it adds to your skills it adds to um your advocacy skills your mediation skills how you need to behave how you need to talk how you need to get through like difficult and tough times and i think a five year law school journey would definitely you know help a student and you know this also brings me to a similar question probably i would direct this to julie because i would want to understand and you know here the participants would want you to share your journey from a practicing lawyer and then building this course of an executive llm program you know what prompted you to take that decision to attend law school everyone's journey is a little bit different right to where where they kind of end up but i was one of the people who always knew that that's what i wanted to do um and that was in an effort to really make a difference to effectuate change which um you know to critique us point there is so much power in the law um and i remember a professor from my law school days saying that on the last day of one of our classes like just the the power that you have as a lawyer to effectuate change and i think that that is really that is you know that is kind of deep within that is really a a powerful statement and you are powerful as a lawyer um and so that was you know the reason i wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer i wanted to make a difference i wanted to uphold the us constitution so there are a lot of real um you know there was like a more um, i felt morally uh, pulled towards the profession um in a lot of ways and then it was interesting that once i was in it and that was from an internship that i did in washington dc at the public defender and after i did that internship i was um in, in my undergraduate years i was determined to go to law school and then it was interesting as i went from a law firm doing structured finance to a criminal defense practice as i made my way through the profession i realized that there were parts of it that did not um that weren't playing to my individual strengths uh as a person so there were parts of just the adversarial system that just didn't um that were not um you know i wasn't like if, fully uh, realizing the parts of my own personality um that I wanted to and then that's when I moved into legal education so I got to combine my love for the law with helping people fulfill a dream and a journey towards um their own you know their on their own educational journey to you know having the power of education so I just sort of shifted um so I still was surrounded by law and lawyers that I love to be at with and and but I I just directed my energies towards helping others on their journey right thanks thanks julie for that and you know it really inspires a lot of young uh, students listening to you, your interest in criminal uh, you know law because that is something it's it's not something which is really accepted as i can say for you know indian law, lawyers especially uh, you know women representing uh, in the criminal courts here so it really is an inspirational story Uh, and you know this brings me to dia now because she's somebody who's seen the corporate field in terms of you know the women leading there so uh, dia if you could share a little bit about your experience you know what are the challenges a woman faces in corporate law and you know what are the steps uh, corporations or legal houses have taken to overcome this uh, in these challenges 
Yeah, so um, as a women lawyer in a corporate, when you start, when when I started, I remember clearly being, um, you know, there was a, some sort of discrimination, if I were to use that word, because the way you are looked at, it, you know, there are some perceptions or biases already in their minds. In the sense, would would the person be able to work long hours? Would the person would need flexibility? You know, those are questions that they, you know, that sometimes when there is an interview happening and you probably narrate saying that you have a family to take care the the technical questions then divert to say, to you know establishing whether you are able to do what you're supposed to deliver in your workplace you know can you manage both can you travel you know very basic questions but that i feel um, you know I've always fought that with my career aspirations and I've tried explaining that I have goals, you know, I, I have a family, but I still have goals which are, which I need to pursue. So I know what I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to push the boundaries and I have things sorted. So those were certain, um, and there are some cases where I've heard people sharing in terms of, you know, if you're on a, you know, let's say maternity benefit and when you return to work, there are changes in the way you are probably treated. Now, those things are still there, unfortunately, but organizations have become conscious about it. We're doing a lot of, there's, there is a lot of inclusion and diversity initiatives which are taken, and we are trying to see how um, there is no difference in when, when you talk to a woman or a man in, when you're sitting in a room full of, let's say, even if it's dominated by male, uh, and, and see how that voice is heard without you know, addressing them with prejudices that you would have that probably she may not be able to deliver or she may not have the, it's not the competency, it's more to do with, it could also be the concern that they're trying to show that, you know, this may be more demanding and stressful and things like that. So those are a couple of things. And I've, I have personally felt that um, there are times that I've had to push a little more, even if it's a simple negotiation that I'm having. And if I have only men on both sides, it's not only my side, I've had to push a little more harder than if it was probably, you know, uh, but uh, I must say that I've also tried to um, use that as my strength. I've not ever told myself that, you know, I'm being, being singled out and I should just stay away and, you know, let it, uh, you know, make peace with it. I've always tried to push that harder, tried to be more, much more, uh, you know, in terms of voicing out what I needed to do and uh, flexed. There are times I've flexed, there are times I've gone beyond what I could have done and tried to prove that, you know, it's, it's not um, all a set of rules, mm -hmm. things have evolved, so. Right. Yeah. I think as women, we anyways face so many challenges and specifically in corporate world, you know, it's seen as a man's world. So I'm, I'm really commendable in, the, in terms of the work you're doing. And, you know, this also brings me to Nehan because she is somebody who is practicing IPR and, you know, you have also balanced your initiative uh, as the CEO of her forum, along with your practice. So, you know, what, first of all, what motivated you to start her forum and what were the challenges you faced while setting up her forum? Um, yeah, thank you for that question, Afreen. I think, um, you know, I, I, as someone, you, you rightly said, law school is five years, it's a long period of time. And through that, you're expected to do various internships. So I, I got, you know, exposure to many professional settings, even before I graduated, whether that was in courtrooms, whether it was in offices. And, uh, you know, even though things are, are changing, I, it, it, there was a very uh, I did observe that very obviously I, I was surrounded by a lot of girls in law school. I was surrounded by enough women at law firms. But if you looked at key positions um, at, at law firms, that's where you could uh, really see the disparity. There was fewer women who were founding partners or senior partners or senior advocates um, even today. Uh, and, and I realized that, you know, and, and I did read up about it a lot. And I realized that there are actually a lot of women doing amazing things. But um, I did feel that there was um, somewhere a lack of visibility or recognition at some level as well. And um, I also didn't see any really um, space or community in India for women to, you know, connect with each other and, and, and help each other and have such a forum of sorts. And so, uh, you know, after graduating is when I decided to start this. And and this was um, also, I think, the, the pandemic, which was, um, you know, such a 
such a painful time for for, for everyone globally. Um, but but in a lot of ways, it has uh, played a role in in businesses and and passion projects and ventures. And for me personally, you know, I I um, we now have a team of of um, five six girls who who work on her forum as well. And we've never met. We've only ever met virtually. And now we're working as a team and building this together. And, and that has been so exciting. And and so many other aspects of it that have played a role. You know, I've uh, you know to be able to reach out. Um, as somebody who doesn't, um, who's a young lawyer, so I, I don't necessarily have uh, connections to senior women in the field or or anyone in my family who's a lawyer. So I did reach out to to women, and and uh, I was lucky enough that. And I was fortunate that they resonated with what I was trying to do. And I think that you know everyone on this panel as well is is bringing up similar points. So I think women in this field do resonate with each other a lot because it, it is common concerns that come out. So um, I was lucky enough that I had uh, women who are uh, you know very inspiring who agreed to come onto our platform and share their insights. Um, and, and because of the pandemic, you know, being able to do an interview with, say, uh, somebody like Mrs. Zia Modi sitting in Bombay or somebody like Mrs. Geeta Luthra sitting in Delhi, which otherwise I probably would not have been able to um, do that quickly in a, in a normal world. So all of those things played a role. And, and we even, you know, do networking events with, with women lawyers all over India virtually. So we have women joining in from Jaipur, Ahmedabad, Bombay, Delhi, doing different things within the legal field, coming and networking with each other, which again, I'm assuming in a physical world would not play out the same way. So um, it's, 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 um, so we've been very fortunate that those things have worked out in our favor, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it was something that uh, obviously I'm very passionate about and, and uh, working from home as well has obviously played a role in me being able to balance that along with my, um, my work uh, as a, as an IP lawyer, um, so so that has been really interesting and and um, and yeah, as as I'm sure everyone agrees on this panel, there um, there is a need for for a community and and that's what we're trying to build um, a community that that can you know support each other and and uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Thanks, Nehan, and I completely agree that you know as women, I think we are multitaskers. You know, we can take up multiple things and handle it at the same time, and that is what you are doing, and it's completely like commendable in terms of how you balance both. Um, and you know, it also you know inspires me to ask the next question to Kritika because she is somebody you know who has practiced law and is has some sort of a leaning towards academia. So, you know, Kritika, what, what has attracted you towards academia? And, you know, how do you compare the legal practice with academia? Also, like, what inspired you to study law? What is your personal journey there? Thank you, Afin, for the question. Um, so, my if I have to talk about my journey, like I said, you know, I decided to pursue law while I was in school because I wanted to create impact. Social impact was what attracted me to this profession. So, when I was taking the final call uh, in my fourth, fifth year, you know, when you have placements, etc., that, you know, whether I'm going to give the corporate world a shot or, you know, it's just going to be something else altogether for me. Uh, I think that's when I decided that, you know, the corporate world is not something that appeals to me. And instead, what I wanted to do was, you know, to get into human rights litigation. Um, so that's how, you know, I got into, you know, I got attached to lawyers who are doing a lot of work in the area of human rights law, or who are doing a lot of work in the area of domestic law, you know, acts like the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, etc. So while I was doing this on the side, even while I was in law school and, uh, you know, once I passed out, I definitely noticed that, you know, there was a lot of, you know, uh, digression between the way the profession was move moving and the way, you know, the place at which law schools were. Um, so I'm from NNU Delhi, which is considered one of the premium institutions of India. But unfortunately, I felt that, you know, none of these law schools have actually evolved since when they were instituted. Right, so there's so much of change that's been happening in the world, um, especially now we're talking about a pandemic, you know, technology has penetrated so deeply into our uh, profession. There's so many opportunities that are being created in this area. Um, law is clearly a preferred career option in India. You know, if you look at the number of graduates that we are churning out every year. Um, so that's when I realized that, you know, this is not in tandem. So, you know, there's clearly a lot of work that is to be required uh, even on the law school front. I mean, there is work that is required on, you know, sort of revamping the curriculum, uh, re-looking the way that we look at law schools in India, legal education in India. 
because while i was in college i got got a great amount of exposure to the us law schools as well and i thought that was really inspiring the kind of model that they had the kind of options that they had available for specialization um and things like that so i thought you know why can you not bring that to india and it kind of really tied up beautifully uh with my innermost desire which was to make impact so that's when you know i thought that this is something that i should definitely latch on to and that's how i ended up you know coming into the law school setting so unfortunately academia never really you know i never thought that i really could teach so instead you know i thought that you know why don't i just work on the other side which is on the management side you know working on setting up these institutions rather and sort of you know acting as a facilitator to bring together some really good faculty from different parts of the country different parts of the world up to india and give access to like world class legal education to students uh, through our law schools that we have at bangalore and kolkata in maharashtra so yeah that's right, the journey definitely that's right with the kind i can see that you know you're working towards that goal and your the mission and not just for vijay movie i think even for ifm law school you know this this journey has been some sort um resonated with how our uh, students are working day and out in terms of achieving their goals and how the universities are supporting to make sure that they can achieve those goals and which you know also brings me to julie because julie is somebody who's actively worked with international schools and ifm being one of them and um, she's been a pioneer in uh, introducing the executive llm program so julie could you elucidate a little more about the executive llm program um Columbia Law School offers, and you know how does it stand out from the other uh, programs offered by law schools in the U.S. I think one of the things that's been brought into sharp focus over the last year is that we must, as legal educators, continue to innovate, continue to look ahead around corners. That we cannot rest um, with the same model that we've always, you know, used for the past 150 years with very little adjustments. I mean, the truth is, we've been teaching the same kind of, um, or we've been having the same kind of legal education, teaching law the same way for a really long time without really stopping to think about whether it's effective, whether it is um, the best way, whether we're using technology the way that we should in the way that we teach. and so i and 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 columbia was already asking these questions or thinking about this but i think all law schools are now maybe around the world but certainly in the us um is thinking about and i think what the one thing the pandemic has done is going to change the way that we um that we teach and that we learn and the way that we live probably overall um but columbia was already thinking about this and even before the pandemic had designed a program that was accessible for lawyers around the world who could not do the what basically the one model of you know masters programs that exists now which is you know taking a year away and traveling to the us and having you know an on campus experience which is wonderful and there are lots of benefits to that but it isn't a one size fits all i mean nothing really is and that certainly is true for legal education so there are sophisticated seasoned lawyers who really seek the growth and the deepening um and the experience and maybe the credential also but they can't have this one size traditional experience um and so the program was designed for those people and it was really based on conversations on market conversations with students and with employers um saying that not only do we want this for people for lawyers but the lawyers saying we want this for ourselves and one of the things we also have recognized is that people often don't carve out time for growth from professional development in their own lives because you're so busy working um you know meeting deadlines and i find this true for myself that i don't unless someone schedules it for me i don't think to take that opportunity to you know grow in something i'm interested in um and so this is just an almost like an excuse this is an opportunity where they can have this growth and this deepening um but still maintain their time eyes and their tethers to their work don't lose they don't lose momentum in their current professional journey but they can have what they need professionally you can have both um and so the program is designed it's partly online and partly in person it kind of combines the best parts of of legal education and really state of the art classes like representing future industries 
teaching business skills like financial statement analysis and data analytics, skills that lawyers need, which is not part of a curriculum normally. So it's trying to combine, you know, the, the practical, and I mean practical, not in sort of the sense that everyone's saying we need practical skills. It's like really the things that you need to be successful as a business lawyer. Um, so it's kind of combining those, but also giving the foundation of U.S. law, which is very helpful for international business lawyers who are constantly saying, I need to know the U.S. law because that's either a model or that's the kind of law that's governing you know the transaction that we're doing and I can make my way around it but I don't really understand it um so it, it, it's, it's trying to meet several it has several purposes but trying to meet a lot of those needs that are in the market right Julie and you know when we talk about business law specifically you can't really study that in isolation you know it's a globalized world and there are transactions happening all across the country and different jurisdictions. So the kind of program Columbia has definitely introduced makes that sort of an impact. And uh, specifically, um, the, the whole model of you adopting the online and the offline bit, I think that really inspires in terms of uh, creating some sort of a balanced approach towards this uh, pedagogy of uh, teaching, right? And, you know, that brings me to the question and I'll try to, you know, direct this to uh, Dia here because what the audience also would like to know is that, you know, there are so many women uh, and uh, studying law at this point of time and they're women lawyers. However, you know, we notice that there are lack of women leaders in top positions. So do you feel this trend is slowly changing and, you know, are there any structural changes you can witness um, at law firms or corporates? <laughs> Well, uh, sadly, it is changing, but the pace at which it is changing is pretty slow because right now, uh, corporates have realized that, you know, at the level, at the sea level or at the top level, the leadership opportunities are predominantly, uh, you know, held by men. And probably there wasn't a structural hierarchy or, or a, you know, like a succession planning that was in place. But now all corporates have started uh, having a succession plan in place. So now when you're a part of a team, you know where you go, you know, as a next step. But the only uh, flip side to it is there are, you know, you have to go through your appraisal cycles and you have to go through cycles, which gives you your promotions and that puts you on to the next grade. Now that still is very, uh, you know, it's, it, I wouldn't say that it's an unfair system, but it, it depends on your immediate manager and your supervisor. So there is a lot of people dependencies that is controlling that. So unless that kind of evolves and it becomes as a part of a system or if it's like automated or I, I don't know, I'm thinking probably out of the box, if there's an AI or, or something doing your evaluation for you and it helps a, you know, a person's performance for the whole year, if that evaluation system changes, then I think it opens up opportunities for us because right now it's all perception based. It depends on what your manager or your super boss has thought about what you've done. So I feel there, you know, the promotions or the opportunities kind of, uh, you know, we are at a back footing at times. And like I said, since we play multiple roles, there are, um, you know, concerns with the concept of work-life balance, which I believe gets misinterpreted many a times, because when we say work-life balance, it's not like we, we don't want time to handle family. We just need time to wind down because we also need to recoup for the next day. So I feel a lot of things from a, uh, from a perception, from a cultural aspect things need to change because when i work so i work for a global company i i talk to people from diverse culture i see that you know th there is a lot of breathing space for people elsewhere and i think india is catching up i'm not complaining we are catching up we are looking at giving flexibility we are looking at uh, how women can do both roles brilliantly and i think this situation i mean the past year taught us that even uh, working from home is 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 something that is a successful model so i believe with everything um, evolving i i'm looking forward to seeing women leaders uh, you know, more of women leaders representing, you know, in representation in the board. So that's what, that's my take on it. 
Right, Dia, and it's you know very encouraging to know that corporate firms are taking those steps to introduce these structural changes because you didn't notice that like at least a decade ago, and that there has been an overt sort of uh, a step taken by these firms to make sure that those those sad sort of discriminations are you know eliminated, and. I, I talk about this is because when I when I see women's role in legal education in India, you know the structures already form, formed, but you still don't see a lot of representation. So that brings me again to Kritika here because you know just recently uh, Dr. Anupama Goel, who was just appointed as the registrar of your alma mater, you know how does it feel? You know, uh, do you do you feel that it's about time we have more women leaders as the face of law school? Um, and do you think it's reducing it? It, had, it helps in reducing some sort of bias and increases like inclusivity amongst faculty. I think that's a very good question. Um, so I definitely feel that uh, as it's true even for court where I see it happen, um, I just feel that you see very few women on the top in terms of legal academia. Um, it's very sad. So when you pick up and you see, you know, the vice chancellors of most of these law schools, law universities, you'll hardly see women. Like I feel they're not more than one or two, right? Who have sort of made a name for themselves and, um, you know, have been given these designations. So when I heard of Dr. Goel being given this position, I was personally very happy because I was like, yes, now we have moved a step forward for sure that, you know, uh, a faculty, a woman faculty from our institution is being given the role of registrar, which is a very important role that's performed in the university. Um, but I personally feel that I think the universities also have to play a very important and pivotal role in making our university workplaces woman friendly. Um, I don't think that, you know, we have made too many strides in that front. Um, I might get a lot of backlash for saying this, but I will be honest about it. Because I still see that a lot of policies, being it sexual harassment at the workplace, um, you know, like Dia was talking about being flexible, um, the way we look at, you know, maternity leave, etc. I think there is a lot of bias that exists in the system, you know, which works against women joining, um, you know, legal academia as well. And frankly, I feel that, you know, legal academia is one thing where we definitely need a large workforce. I mean, it's very sad that unfortunately in India, we do not have too many uh, people who are opting to join academia, right? I mean, that's why we sort of have a scarcity of good law, law teachers and law professors in India. So, I mean, we have to make it very attractive. So I feel with this entire COVID-19 pandemic, where we have had this forced experimentation of doing work from home, which has to some I won't say that it's going to replace completely. It cannot replace physical education, but definitely like Julie was talking about, right? It definitely inspires confidence in a hybrid model, right? So if we can sort of adopt these kind of practices, I think this is definitely going to... I just lost Kritika for a few seconds there. Uh, we'll just come back to, you know, Kritika's point in terms of certain leaders taking that sort of an initiative in the legal academia field and you know i'll just direct it to nehan now because i feel that um, you know you have so many stories to tell through um, your her forum uh, in terms of you know if you've heard of any experiences or any instances where you felt that you know women need to prove or showcase her talent as compared to men Right. And how, how do you think, um, as a woman in the profession, how important it is for women to continue and grow their presence in law and take these leadership roles? So, I mean, definitely, this is something that's probably a common running theme, whether it's uh, in the conversations we have, whether it's in the events we do, the roundtable discussions we do. Um, I think that, um, you know, even personally, uh, you know, I was thinking about it when, when Dia was speaking and... Um, when you talk about cultural biases, I mean, of course, there's no denying that biases exist for both men and women, but in a professional setting, it's, it's definitely a lot more real for women. And that does translate to, um, to your professional life being affected. Um, I personally remember, and this is one of the instances that got me thinking when I was 
interning at a law firm and uh, i was working in a team where there was a male and a female a senior associate and there was a a mess up that had happened in that particular matter so the senior partner was obviously upset but but while um pulling up the team uh, i remember that he specifically referred to um the women associate and said and asked her if she was unable to perform her duties because of wanting to wrap up and go home to a child and and take care of her child and and i later realized that it was even the male associate who had a child at home but um that's obviously not something that that came up and and so i think that goes back to the point about the cultural bias and uh, and I'm, and i'm sure this you know plays out in different ways but um this does uh, you know end up affecting uh, how you view your job and how how well how much you can do um so i think that uh, you know such instances come up in so many of our conversations even some of the most senior members in the profession have spoken about when they started off i mean at, at when i'm when i'm entering the profession i think i'm more fortunate to have so many role models around me but um i remember in our interview with with mrs zia modi as well she spoke about how when she entered and came back to litigation in india she was uh, you know one woman among so many men and she had to prove herself constantly to be able to then get more cases and 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 this this is common i think no matter which um spectrum of the field you're in um so i think that um i think that it's obviously i believe you know going back to your second question it's so important for women in this profession to take up leadership roles i mean uh, i think i mean that's obviously why i started her forum because i believe that's probably the most important thing and i think that's for two reasons right one is that uh, when you do end up taking up leadership positions you pave the way for more women you inspire more women and and uh, you know having conversations with with women who speak about you know starting um, founding law firms and and then being the best in their sector for that or uh, you know we had a conversation with a woman who was the first uh, kurdish woman to ever go to harvard law school um and and then and, and so there's so many interesting conversations so inspiring and and that's obviously paving the way for more women in her community to to then be able to dream of doing that and i think the second reason it's important is what what kritika was just talking about which is that uh when you have more women who are making decisions when you have more women who are in leadership positions then policies and infrastructure is also drafted and and uh, facilitated in a more mindful way there are obviously more um, you know nobody understands a woman better than a woman and and obviously uh, we do um i obviously think that men are, are allies in in this as well but uh, the fact that women need to be represented at leadership roles is so important because they are the ones who can then draft those policies which will affect uh, how the workspace is run um so i think that's why it's extremely important right nihan thank you so much for that and i would actually like kritika to just join us back and you know conclude with what you were saying in terms of the initiatives probably you know universities are making to make sure that uh, women take up these top positions or even get a chance to even think about having those top positions there uh thank you so much arthreen uh so definitely i think legal academia for sure can act as a very good platform to promote a lot of women to kind of you know get integrated in the profession and one thing that i think that academia needs to like in india do away with the fact that you know professionals cannot teach like if you're practicing you cannot teach i think there's a lot of value that you know when i see practitioners engage with students there's so much value that they add to the theoretical learning of the children so you know if you know universities law schools are more open to the idea of you know like having like you know their faculty teaching virtually or you know just having professionals also have like a part time faculty job i think that's going to open like a multitude of opportunities for you know a lot of women professionals as well as the men and also is going to enhance the learning of students at law school right so it's going to be a dual purpose that is served second is the fact that now i am seeing that you know slowly and steadily at least in some of the national law schools i am observing this trend that a lot of you know young like women who have just finished law are considering the option of getting into research and getting into academia now when that is happening i think this is the point where the universities have to step up in their game because you know these are well qualified you know uh, women lawyers who are backed by you know foreign llm degrees they have a great undergraduate um, you know undergraduate degree and also mind you these are people who have gone through the five year degree program so you know actually if you see a lot of our faculty have gone through a different kind of a program and they teach the five year program 
right so it's great to have somebody who's gone through the five year program to actually teach the you know a uh, five year program so you know keeping that in mind i think it's important that you start you know you are liberal enough to give administrative responsibilities to these faculty members as well somehow it so happens that you know the men kind of take all the administrative responsibilities and i see hardly very few that trickle down to the women so i think we need to make that extra effort of you know making sure that you know able women faculty members should also get access to those opportunities because that is going to be a very good example and that's actually going to attract a lot of good talent into teaching as well because when you know you see people doing well in that particular you know path you know as academicians that's what's going to make it lucrative for other people to join in as well so those were just my two cents on that particular question thanks krithika and i hopefully you know because you are an active member of the board you know you could place these sort of uh, suggestions at universities and represent and even talk to you know the other lsac global law alliance members we have on board i think this is something which we need to have an open dialogue about having more representation even in the admin you know side of the universities not just the teaching line of it but taking up these important roles and responsibilities now you know we are running a little off the time and there are like various questions um the participants have asked so i'll quickly move on to the, these questions so first being um this is by one of the anonymous you know attendee they're saying what are the benefits of passing out from national law schools and have all you passed out from them as well please share that so i know on the panel we have a mix in terms of you know people studying from national law schools and non national law schools so i think i'll throw it open to nehan first and then probably kritika can take over so do you you can share your journey because you know you you do not belong from the nlu tags there so do you think there are any benefits as such um so regarding the benefits since i i wouldn't know i'll i'll leave that up to kritika to share what the benefits really are uh, i guess i can speak about the flip side of it which is um you know what 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 really what 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 makes the difference um i think personally i could only speak from experience which is that uh from my understanding law school being 5 years is probably one of the longest professional degrees uh, out there in india and and i think it's really what you make of it right so uh you have people uh coming into law school knowing exactly what they want to do and then that changing over time you have people coming into law school and then graduating and not even pursuing law sometimes and then you have people uh, who who take up different paths so i think that it's really what you make of your of your time there i think that one thing that i i think um has really um uh, stood out for me is to continue to be curious um i think that that's uh, a really uh, sort of valuable lesson because i think the opportunities are so immense um like someone rightly pointed out earlier nowadays it's just uh, you know the opportunities are boundless and so i would say that um in terms of law schools in india from my understanding uh there has been a perception which i know you know very well exists with law firms as well where they would prefer to hire students from national law schools and um and i think that that's slowly now changing because now it's really a matter of uh, of your uh, you know hard work your integrity your co competency and that's really what it boils down to at the end of the day um but i'm sure that there are benefits that do come with with belonging to um you know an institution that that's known for for delivering good education so i mean i'm i'm happy to hear kritika's thoughts on that over to you do you, do you want to really burst this myth around nlus and you know nlus versus non nlus i was sure you were going to ask me this question because you know usually which side i lean on um so firstly i think you know i think it's important to understand what are the advantages and disadvantages right uh personally i feel the only advantage that an nlu gives you is the peer group that you have uh because you know students have come from a highly competitive exam uh so you know by virtue of that you end up being with a set of individuals who are very driven who are very focused and it's great because then because of you know being surrounded by such a peer group you sort of you 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 are you know it's ensured that you're swinging and you're you know driving in the right direction but that is personally what i feel the only benefit uh the reason why i say that is because i feel the law schools the national law schools have stagnated in the evolution process um unfortunately you know everybody has become so comfortable with the same curriculum that's been rolled out since the first national law school in bangalore of 1989 nobody has actually taken the pain of you know actually reinventing the wheel 
So I see a lot of innovation that is happening in the private law school setup in that sort of area. Now, if you talk about opportunities, yes, absolutely, it it exists in some measure that you know the NNU kids have it a little bit easy because there's that tag attached to to them. But having said that, if that is going to be the be all and end all reason of them getting access to our opportunities that is not true i think any law student you can be from any law school be it private edu if you make a conscious effort of building a good cv from the first year itself you make sure that you're tapping into the right opportunities you can cut away you know you can easily cut that sort of discrimination that exists because i must tell you that you know people sitting in the law firms are really not idiots it's not like you know they're only going to get attracted and just oh you're from nlu okay we take you you're from some other xyz law school we don't take you no there is a thorough analysis that they do into understanding what is the kind of work that you have engaged in what are the kind of research papers you have written what kind of moots have you participated in what kind of short certificate courses you have done and all of these in itself actually make a wholesome cv right and that is what your focus has to be it's it's absolutely okay it's a matter of chance that you might make it to a national law school or not i mean if i talk about nlu delhi there are you know close to about 20000 students who write that exam every year to make it to the top 80 um if you talk about clat you have around 50000 students who write it for those 2000 seats in the various national law university it's really sometimes also a matter of chance you can't just be having a bad day but that cannot be your decision that cannot be the you know the fact that oh i'm not made it to nlu that means i'm not going to be a great lawyer no that's not true if you look at some of the best lawyers that we have they have not come from the national law schools right so it's really about don't lose focus of your goal which is to be a great lawyer and to make sure that you're on that track just make sure you're making the most of the opportunities and i have to say the kind of hand holding that i'm seeing private law schools do the kind of mentoring that they do i'm seeing the kind of effort that the internships and placement cells make in getting their children the right internship i don't think that you know there is any difference in the opportunities that you will get between the two in fact you might just get a better mentor in a private law school so please don't lose heart if you don't make it to a national law school there's not much that you're missing thank you krutika for that i mean this is a certain question we always get from students and it's important to address it because ultimately it really matters what kind of journey you go through to your five year course not not the university in itself but the kind of opportunities you grab on from day one so i think that really encourages the students to understand this whole buzz around nlus and non nlus this brings me to another question this is asked by sayed who would want to know that um especially is directed to julie that what is it like to work in a law firm and any advice or suggestions uh, because somebody hopefully would like to become would like to work in a law firm and i would also direct the same question to dia maybe from the indian perspective you know how is it different there so julie you could go on and address that question so the question is was it like to work in a law firm right <laughs> um so i worked in a big law firm in manhattan um in structured finance so i just want to frame the situation um so it's not this i don't think there's one experience had by all um in different cities around the world your experience might be different um but it was very um it was very much sort of a traditional a uh, sort of um environment where the same is kind of expected of all and it's it's long hours not a lot of predictability so i maybe that's um maybe that's actually proving true the 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 what perception maybe that's actually proving true this perception but it it was very much like that i will say the people were the best part about it so i think that when i was interviewing i was mostly concerned about the people i'd be working alongside and then that was a good decision so it was less about um i think maybe the you know prestige of the firm or besides it was more of just about the people that i would be spending the time with but it was very long hours um and and a lot of unpredictability so there wasn't a lot of being able to schedule um 
you know, scheduled things because you had to expect to be at work, which is why I didn't last too long. I was there for about two and a half years. Um, and, and, and then I got to move back to my passion job, which was criminal defense. So, um, and I just wanted to speak a little bit to the, maybe, um, maybe baked in that question might be as a woman also. So in, you know, in that environment and as a woman, and at the time I was there, I was a younger woman, so I didn't have a family yet. Um, but I saw, you know, the, the partners that I worked with and the other women, which there were not a lot, and there were not a lot of women in the higher. And I think that that's because the environment is not friendly, it has not been friendly to women. And I don't think that it's women to change their, their values or their priorities or the way that they would like, um, you know, to, to have both a family and a career. I think something needs to change about the industry. And so that was, and the only way I think that changes is to kind of echo some of the other comments the panelists have made is for women to be in those positions and to say, I have a family and you must play nice with my family because I cannot do my job if I cannot also do my family. Um, and so there just has to be more women that are taking that stand for things to really change. Because if it's only men making those decisions, then it won't change the environment for women. So that was like one thing I just wanted to add in there is that we women need to advocate for women. I mean, that's part of our responsibility um, to do. And we need to amplify their voices. So um, the voice of women so then make sure that others hear that as well right thanks thanks julie for that and um, you know over to you dia what do you think the experience has been and uh, of course julie has mentioned you know the women perspective to it but um, i think this question is coming from a specific um, understanding as to what the culture looks like whether you're a girl or a boy or you know representing other communities what is the culture like in a law firm when you join a law firm or a corporate, I think the first thing that you will have to understand is the pulse of the organization, because, you know, in India, there are organizations which follow the concept of a flat organization. There aren't any hierarchies. There are organizations which still probably is a little hierarchical. So once you understand the pulse of that organization and try to imbibe in the culture, like every company will have a culture, will have a way of working. Um, I think it is difficult when you start because you, you feel that you're probably doing things which are not that interesting. You're doing the same old job every day. It might just be reading through a lot of files, a lot of paper, not, not something which is fancy in your um, you know minds or what you would have imagined rather. But my advice is, you know, it's okay to do a few things to learn the work because you see that's sort of an on the job training, which may be a little mundane, but it probably, but yeah, you should have a direction. You should know what you're trying to do. I'm not saying that you should have a pile of things to be, you know, given to you and, you know, you don't have a direction. There should be clarity as to what you're expected to deliver. Those things are very important. You should speak up if there are things that are uh, objectionable. If things uh, don't, I mean, if you don't agree with something uh, and if there are, you know, like I said, like, like Julie mentioned, you need to have a balance in your head about your personal and professional. You should not feel overwhelmed because it's your, you know, you're just beginning and you have to create an impression and people should not think, oh, my God, there is a problem. And, you know, that should not be at the back of your mind. I think you need to be free of all of those baggages and the motto you should follow is learn the work that you have to do and then try to create your impression by doing more work i mean that's my advice i don't i i believe networking is important having a good rapport with your colleagues you spend like most of your time with them it's important but do work so that that kind of speaks for you you don't really have to go and you know plead to people or explain your case. I mean, that's my advice. And I think the first five to six or seven years of your corporate or your law firm, yes, you do have to burn the midnight oil and do all sorts of things to kind of create that position for your um, self. So, yeah, that's my take on it. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dia, for that. Um, I have a very interesting question, and th this comes from Shraddha. She would like to know that when it comes to legal profession, uh, we see a lack of diversity and inclusion, women, and especially the LGBTQ plus community. Um, how can law schools and law firms address this and open the doors for the LGBTQ plus community? And I think this is open to everybody on the panel. I mean, uh, one of you can just go ahead and address it. I'll, I would like to know each and everybody's view on this. So, uh, I mean, would Nehan, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to law schools or a law firm, I think it, the way people feel, uh, you know, whoever it is um, in a particular setup depends on how uh, that environment is built, um, how it's facilitated. And again, I think that goes back to the leadership and the people making the decisions. So I think it's really important, um, you know, uh, when you talk about inclusion, I mean, we, we're here talking about how there is, um, you know, steps being taken to make it more inclusive for women. Um, and I think that the same um, should apply for the LGBTQ community. I think that um, even for them, I think that um, law firms are becoming more and more aware. We actually, uh, you know, are fortunate enough to be uh, in conversation with a lot of firms who have uh, now, I believe, set up specific diversity and inclusion uh, verticals just to address this. And that's obviously a really good sign, uh, but that's still very few who are, who are taking it that seriously. And, uh, and, and then the question really is that it, it's easy to, to set up these things and put these policies in place, but then is that actually trickling down to the bottom and is that being implemented? Um, so I think it's really important um, for, for that to be taken seriously. And then for, for law firms and law schools to, to measure if that's actually happening. You know, how many people do you have within your office space? How many people do you have within your leadership positions that belong to that community? I think that will speak a lot for how much um, of an impact um, is actually being created. Right. Thanks, Nehan. And, you know, I would like to know from law school's perspective. So, you know, Julie, you could let me know. What are the steps taken, say, by Columbia Law School or other law schools in the U.S. to make ensure that there's in inclusivity and diversity in law? I was going to say this might have a very specific cultural bent to it, so I mean, it may be more helpful for the, you know, for the Indian law school representatives to speak to this because I think it's um, a little bit uh, maybe different culturally in the U.S. But you know, there's very much been a movement in law schools already to create. I'll call it affinity organizations, but I'm not really sure that affinity is the right term, but, um, you know, organizations where people who affiliate with different, um, you know, traits or characteristics or lifestyles, whatever it might be, belong to these groups and have a real voice um, in the community. And that, that has been sort of a longstanding, you know, already in the universe, at the university level, which are quite progressive. So, um, you know, I, I, I think just creating space um, for, for those individuals. And I think to me and also made this point is to have the, you know people that are representative of, of those areas in leadership roles is also um, is also very very important and so there are a lot of programmings and events and organizations and groups and I think that's been kind of a long-standing um, you know or ongoing um, commitment by the university and I mean now we're really seeing that more with being anti-racist so ours is more more around racism you know that's sort of more of the latest movement and creating you know more space and programs are becoming anti-racist institution so that, that's where our focus at the moment is um is but I, I think this might have a cultural piece to it that may be more relevant for um you know some of my other colleagues to our panelists to answer that's that's right julie and you know i'll quickly divert this to kritika here you know do you think law schools in india are taking that sort of an initiative well Afin, i think we are so uh, I think first thing uh, that really needs to happen at a law school level is you have to have an open environment where conversations can happen. I think that's incredibly important, uh, right? So some of the things that we do, for example, is that we make sure that we have a lot of discussion forums uh, where we discuss, you know, uh, topics which are related to access for people of the LGBTQ community and also create a sort of a safe space. I think that's really important, like creating a safe space where people can express themselves. People are not worried even about coming up. I think that is one thing that's really important that, you know, universities have to create an atmosphere where people can truly express themselves, be it their orientation or even their ideas for that matter, not get heckled. 
so um you know like for example um i mean i saw this in nlu delhi and i was very careful about this when we were doing this kind of uh, you know these kind of initiatives with ifm and vijay bhumi is i saw a lot of our seniors and some of my friends who did try to come out they were heckled quite a bit and they did have a very bad experience so one thing that that definitely taught me is that if there is an instance in the slightest that happens it's important that the authorities act at the right minute and take this very very seriously so that is one thing that i think is important coming back to the conversation of dialogue i think it's important even with your other initiatives like for example you know when you have film club right so we all have film clubs in universities and colleges it's important that you pick certain kinds of movies certain kind of documentaries that are also throwing light on these kind of issues and then have like a breakout session after that where you discuss it because only when you discuss it is when you start you know changing the mindset of people and third which i think is most important is and it's not something that shri did uh, spoken about is increasing access to universities law schools particularly uh, for this particular discussion to even the transgender community um unfortunately uh, in india if you were to see i think there was only till now there's been i think one person from the community who uh, you know took admission in the national law school bangalore and i don't know where that there is you know where are we on that as of now um but you know just having this kind of a conversation you know like with other you know like it has to be a collaborative effort i think the law schools also have to come together and have a conversation about you know how can we make our spaces more accessible um and you know like you, you know we have very strict sort of hostel accommodations that you know we have a men and the women hostel how can we make it more fluid you know in a time where we are talking about a lot of fluidity i think these are some important uh, topics that we have to revisit and i'm very proud to say that in both of our institutions we have a very progressive outlook to it and i you know i think this is important that you know we all come together and talk about these so called taboo topics so that you know we really make education accessible to all and make it a pleasant experience for everybody because i don't think i can say this enough if colleges don't take this and take this seriously you cannot imagine the kind of harrowing experience that a student goes through in law school or in any university for that matter in fact i have seen students who have dropped out from the program because of that because they have been so scarred so i think it's really important that you know we take this a little bit seriously have conversations about it and be very strict when it comes to sanctions you know when we have on to word and at uh, incidents that take place in our work camp right prithika and you know i absolutely agree that it has to start at law school level you know students are very proactive they have these open dialogues but it has to start somewhere and like you said we can see that sort of a model being you know adopted through different mediums with you know social clubs and book reading clubs or you know movie clubs that's where it starts but it's important that some active you know initiatives are done and once it starts to starts in law school it'll slowly percolate in you know law firms and different cultures as well so i'm glad we had this conversation on this panel today uh, and you know take this forward and i hope the participants have something to take away from this discussion so i know we are already running out of time so i'll stop the q and a's here i'll request the participants to write to us we'll definitely address your questions but before closing i would like each one of the panels to tell tell us you know who are your role models and why do you look up to them and specifically if there are women role models you have and you know just like 10 seconds over it so that you know the participants are left inspired so um probably dia you could go first i need some time to think about that i didn't uh... sure sure i mean i'll open it to anybody who would want to go first for this one yes uh julie would you like to sure i'll go um you know i really it it is my boss that i that i report to and i will tell you why because i think that the role the people who we engage with routinely daily um and and she's a woman and she's a woman of color and those are the people that have the biggest impact at least in my experience on my life and it doesn't so it doesn't have to be you know i think it's the people that we're really engaged with the people who and and one and she's been a an absolute example for me and how to amplify and advocate for other women she has almost all women reports she promotes women she is the woman example of flexibility family first i mean this and so this she's taught me to how 
how I manage the women that report to me. And so to me that, that, you know, the, the role model is the person that I engage with the most professionally, who's been an example for me and how I can advocate for other women. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for that. Uh, yes, Kritika. May I go first? Feel free. No, I was, I was going to respond. Um, I mean, I was going to follow up. I actually completely agree with Julie and I was thinking the same thing. I think that, you know, uh, sometimes it's women who, who you meet and, and for me, in fact, it's not even one person. Sometimes I feel like it's different qualities from different women you come across that, that really stand out for you. And I feel that for me, uh, spe specifically for women, I think that one quality is really adaptability or like resilience. I think it's something you just inherently have. And, and I see that with, with all the women around me as well. And uh, I, I think that um, I, I was, I just remember the other day, I, I saw this video online of this women anchor who was uh, giving the weather forecast and, and she's obviously doing it from home because of, because she's working from home and, and her child crept down below her and was holding her leg in the middle of the live forecast. And she just picked her child up and continued to smile and continue to give the, the weather forecast. And I think that that's, that's like a small example of how uh, women tend to continue to do and, and deal with whatever challenges it is with a smile or, or just their daily job even, you know, and, and I think that's, so I think resilience and adaptability is something that I really look up to and, and aspire to uh, imbibe as much as possible. I think I totally agree with Nehan there. I mean, uh, both actually, Juni and Nehan there. Because I think that, yeah, definitely a lot of my inspiration also comes from the people around me. And like Nehan said, I think, you know, there are kind of different uh, qualities that I sort of take from different people. And I definitely think, you know, adaptability and the uh, ability to evolve is something that I think, you know, women generally top in. Um, and the third thing that I think which is very important that I've, and th that's also the reason why I believe that women are very good administrators is the ability to multitask. Um, and I think that is something I've seen very like effectively both in my mother and mother-in-law, the way they multitask. I mean, and also their communication skills are fantastic. Like usually I see, and not to stereotype here, but you know, usually, you know, I've seen the men in the family usually answer in like monosyllables, but you know, women are great, like, you know, communicators and you know, it's fantastic to see how they you know engage with like different 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 kind of groups of you know people on a daily basis so i think totally agree with both julia and nehanya i think all the different women that we see or we even read about you know historically have been uh, powerhouses of energy i think you know there's so much that you can learn and imbibe from each of them and which can be implemented in our lives today right thanks thanks Kritika, for that uh, yes they are over to you uh, so I think uh, I can't name one role model because I've I've had the privilege to work with many uh, women leaders as in they were non-lawyers, but they've inspired me in like many ways wherein they've actually been very inclusive where they have not seen me as, you know, like when you work in a corporate setup, a lawyer is always seen as someone who probably will be an outsider because she's trying to pick on the risk and stop a deal or, you know, you know, having a, because the business wants to probably close a deal and we are trying to say, no, there's risk. But then this person showed me and we belong to different cultures. We had nothing in common, but I remember the way she kind of made me feel inclusive. We, she, we kind of, we are very good friends now more than colleagues. And uh, she taught me how to speak up. And, you know, like every time I'm faced with a problem or I kind of in a situation where I don't know, I kind of take her example or I kind of take that inspiration and I kind of put my point uh, forward and I don't really feel dominated and cowed down because I'm kind of doing a job and, you know, I'm dependent on that. So that's um, an inspiration that I've taken. Thank you. Thank you, Leah, for that. So and as closing remarks, I would just like to say that, you know, at LSAC Global, uh, we are driven by a goal to expand, diversify and strengthen legal systems in India. And because of this firm belief, LSAC makes resources available for law aspirants uh, and to promote broad based diversity in legal education across legal professions. So today, I think the legal profession needs women like you, you know, who look like you, think like you, bring sort of those valuable and unique experiences to 
to the cause of advancing justice. And at LSAC Global, we aim to bring law aspirants closer to their dream by becoming su successful lawyers through the LSAT India examination. So a small announcement for the participants that this year, the LSAT India would be conducted uh, twice in a year, one in the month of March and one in the month of June. Uh, for the March administration, the registrations are open and they close on 14th of March and the test would be conducted on the 25th of March. Uh, if students feel that they want to better their score, they could appear for the second time in the month of June, which will be conducted in uh, from June 14 onwards and the last date for that registration is June 4th. Um, I would request all the participants to watch this space because we will be coming up with webinars every month uh, in terms of these prophylic and, you know, engaging dialogues. So once again, I would like to thank the panelists for taking out time from their busy schedules to motivate law aspirants today. And I thank the audience members as well for the active participation and the LSAC Global team for the successful conduct of the webinar. See you soon uh, on the next one. Until then, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.